Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. My name is Trey Grace, and I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. Uh, we want to pay particular welcome, even though this is our second form of the year, and some of you were here last night. Uh, we want to welcome all the freshmen and first-year Kennedy School students and other first-year students uh, from across the campus to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, as well as all the returning students and members of the community. Uh, tonight, we've got a great speaker, a great interviewer. There's nothing going on in the world. You know, we were talking about that in the green room. It's just boring in the world. You know, I'm sorry you're all going to a, hear a boring conversation. No, it's going to be really exciting. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce one of my colleagues, Graham Allison. Uh, Professor Allison is the director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and was the founding dean of the Modern Kennedy School and was the visionary that helped to create the space that is the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. So please welcome me, join me in welcoming Graham Allison. Okay, so thank you very much for coming, and I think we have an exciting evening. It's a great pleasure to welcome back uh, to the forum and to the Kennedy School, uh, Richard Haas, our colleague. Uh, Richard uh, uh, is the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, which is the uh, bastion of the American foreign policy establishment, for those of you international students who may not know. He's, uh, uh, if you were doing Gilbert and Sullivan language, I think you would say he's the very model of a modern Kennedy School alumnus who's uh, interested in international affairs. Uh, but unfortunately, he didn't graduate from the Kennedy School. He only taught here. Okay? So uh, here you can see a picture of Professor Haas when he was here. I recruited him. I worked very hard to try to get him to stay here, but he kept running away to government. So. In 1993, he went off to become, in the first Bush administration, on the National Security Council, the assistant to Prince Scowcroft. 89. 80, sorry, 89. Uh, and then in, 19, in 2001, again for the second President Bush, he became the director of policy planning for Colin Powell, who was then the Secretary of State, in the second Bush administration. He's one of the few people that was actually in the, in the inside for two wars with Iraq, which will be one of the topics uh, we'll come to. And he's spoken here in the forum a number of times. One of the great, uh, uh, at, or great resources here at the Kennedy School is that the Institute of Politics, Kathy and uh, Gray, have put all of the forums up on the video uh, library. So you can go and see what Richard said on previous occasions. For example, okay. Oh dear. Can we see Richard in the forum? Which then brings me to more what leadership is. And I would simply say that this is Richard it is the ability to persuade people to adopt things and all that. But it's also the ability still to be persuaded. And that leadership, funnily enough, involves as much listening as directing. And I think it's probably counterintuitive because, again, we think of people as leaders, of leaders as people who point. But in fact, the best leaders are people who not only point, but people who listen. Okay, that's 1994. There are a half dozen more of them up. I would suggest you go to it. It's a fantastic uh, uh, resource that the Institute has put up. Tonight, uh, we're going to start with Foreign Policy Begins at Home. This is Richard's most recent book. And for the president of the Council on Foreign Relations to be telling us, worry more about at home, not about foreign affairs, is a, is a stretch. And he makes a very interesting argument. We'll want to dig in on it a bit. I'm going to start by posing questions. He's going to answer uh, directly and succinctly, I trust. And then we'll come to the audience here in a few minutes. So let me start with the Kennedy School students. So here, new students have shown up. Uh, some of us have been here for a long time. You're telling, talking to students. And they say, I'm dreaming of a career like yours. If you want to see the career, look at, your, at, the, at the resume here between the academy and think tanks and leadership in the public sector and jobs in government. So uh, what lessons do you have to suggest to us? And just to remind you, you wrote a very good book when you were here, or just when you left, called The Bureaucratic Entrepreneur, the subtitle of which is uh, wonderful. It's called How to Be Effective in Unruly Organizations. So uh, what would you say for a new student? I'm still getting over the hair. Uh, <laughs> it's a, uh, 
That was just two wars ago, yes. Two, oh, wars ago, yeah. two wars in two decades. Uh, well, the good news is that if you're here, you already made a good start. Uh, and if you happen to be an American, you have the advantage of uh, an ability to move in and out. There's very few other systems or societies in the world that have that degree of flexibility. Especially one of the advantages of being uh, an American is you don't really have to decide what you want to do when you grow up. Uh, you don't have to make a career decision early on to, to be a, a professional. You, if you're willing to live with a degree of uncertainty, you can do what I did, which is uh, move in and out. It's got disadvantages as well, in, uh, including a lot of uncertainty, and you have to be prepared to, to live with that, that you don't really have a base, except you, you carry around uh, yourself. Uh, general uh, recommendations. Uh, one is to get a... Uh, a foundation in something. My own preference is for history, but it could be economics, it could be politics, whatever. But that said, not limiting yourself to the base. Graham and I were talking about this before. Universities, great universities like Harvard have departments. The world does not have departments. Uh, things are not organized by intellectual uh, or disciplinary silos. So there is a strong argument for getting beyond. And I would say now, even if you're not an economics student, you've got to have some economics. And in the age, if you're young, I would say, gee, looking at the next era of history, knowing something about digital issues, about cyber issues, is going to be uh, essential. For American students in particular, I'd say learn something about the world. One of the tragedies of our educational system, one of the many, is we don't do a very good job of teaching about the world. What you and I called civics or social studies growing up is often now an elective, if that. As we squeeze budgets, often, um, with the emphasis on learning basic STEM subjects, uh, we often don't teach people about the world. So uh, that. Uh, I'm a great old believer also in jobs. Get experience. Take the job, if you have the luxury of it, where you learn the most. The, the most important things when you're, you're young, it's like being an athlete. It's getting developed and getting stretched. And I think there's also something to be said for going in early, to learn things, to, to start this process of being exposed to government to get a sense, if you will, to use the cliche for how the sausage is made. There's something to be said for getting a feel for that. That's something we teach here at the Kennedy School, and which I think is actually at the heart of uh, one of the most important lessons you could ever learn, is that it's not just enough to be smart, it's not just enough to be right, it's not just enough to be able to do effective analysis, as valuable as all that is, but you've also got to think about what is doable, and then you've actually got to do it. And a big chunk of life is implementation or execution. And good ideas that can't be executed and implemented, either because they lack feasibility or they lack political support, then I go back and question whether they're really good ideas. And uh, it's something to uh, think about uh, as you essentially uh, recommend or prescribe, is to, to think through. Uh, to basically play chess and not checkers, to think several moves down the road and to think what it would take to implement it. It's a, it's a dynamic uh, world, and smart people have to be clear and careful not to get hung up on the elaborate intellectualization of what is desirable. So I think you got a capsule of a course. I think you better stop now because otherwise some of us who try to teach here are going to have people throwing rocks at us saying, get Richard back, which is, would be a good idea. His book actually is a good uh, short summary of some of those lessons, but let me take you to the current book. So Richard, you wrote a book called, just uh, this published this year, Foreign Policy Begins at Home. Now in one sense, that would seem like it's obvious, in, the, in that obviously a country can't be more powerful abroad than its economic foundations at home, but your argument is more complex and more nuanced. Yeah. So why did you think it was appropriate to try to put this much energy into that argument in this country at this time? Well, to be honest, it's not a book I ever thought I would write. And I didn't set out to write it so much as it, it wrote itself. It's two things that led me to write this book. And they're, they're two of the central messages of the book. One is that over the last 10 to 15 years, I believe the United States has lost its way in the world. We've had these two enormous wars, uh, the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan, and just to be clear, uh, the war in Iraq was a war of choice from the get-go. We didn't have to go to war. We chose to go to war. And while the war in Afghanistan began as a war of necessity, 
when the government there, the Taliban government, would not oust al-Qaeda. I believe the United States had no choice but to go to war. The desire to expand the war, both the ends and means of the war, particularly by the Obama administration, when it early on tripled U.S. force levels and decided to try to remake Afghanistan. I thought both, the, both of those efforts, the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan, to be generous, uh, I would call them ill-advised. And I think history will show that the returns on our investment, the human investment, uh, more than 6,000 Americans lost their lives, more than 40,000 were injured, the economic investment, trillion, a trillion and a half of direct costs, the indirect costs to our, uh, our nation and measured in all sorts of ways, I think will be, uh, will be enormous. And I think the, the benefits, shall we say, will be, uh, will be quite modest and short-lived. So part of why I wrote this book was a real sense of what you might call overreach, that we were trying to do things in the world that no amount of effort could, could accomplish. Uh, doing more doesn't always get you more. And uh, has a lot to do with whether s situations are susceptible to being uh, changed. So that was one, one thing that led me to do this, was a, a sense that we were, we were doing too much of the wrong things in the world. Secondly, that we weren't doing enough of the right things at home. If we were overreaching abroad, we were underachieving here at home. And that the American political system, its dysfunctionality, to use a familiar word now, alas, a familiar word, had become paramount. And we were unable to address the shortcomings in our infrastructure, our immigration system, our schools, our budgets, our long-term entitlement obligations, and so on and so forth. And there's something very wrong. And over time, it means not only will we not be able to set an example the rest of the world will want to emulate, we will not be able to generate the resources we need to be an effective world leader. And that is bad for the world, because this, this is not a world that can lead it itself. It's not a self-leading world, if you will. For those of you who studied economics, there's no invisible hand out there in the geopolitical marketplace. This is not a world that's going to order itself absent uh, us. And the United States cannot escape the consequences of a messy world. To use another uh, cliche, if you will, you know, we can't become a giant gated community. And what happens there won't stay there. You know, the world is not Las Vegas. What happens there will visit us here for better and for worse, and often for worse, if we're not out there creating conditions of uh, order. And so what led me to this book, was uh, to write this, was a real concern, again, that we were misguided in what we were trying to achieve abroad. And we weren't tending to the foundations of, uh, of American power. You mentioned your, uh, another book that he's written, which I like also very much, called War of Necessity and War of Choice. I mentioned earlier that Richard was one of the few people that actually was on the inside for two wars against Iraq. And one of the episodes you write about in uh, this book is, I think, one of the surreal moments for me in American foreign policy and national security decision making, among many uh, surreal moments. But here I'm reading from the book, okay? And here you are, the uh, director of policy planning for Colin Powell, who's the Secretary of State, in the Bush administration in 2002. Colin is, the, is a, a, you know, a, a international figure. You were his key person for foreign policy issues, especially in the Middle East. You go to visit Condi Rice. Condi is the national security advisor for President Bush. And here, here's what it says. I have the quote here. I began my meeting with Condi this is July 2002. Remember, the U.S. actually attacked Iraq in April, March, March of 2003. So this is nine months before. I began my meeting with Condi by, noticing, by noting that the administration seemed to be building momentum towards going to war with Iraq. I reminded her that I knew something about this issue. Given my role in the previous Bush administration and background in the Middle East, so I asked her directly, quote, are you really sure you want to make Iraq the centerpiece of the administration's foreign policy? I was about to follow up with another question when Condi cut me off. Quote, you can save your breath, Richard. The president has already made up his mind on Iraq. The way she said it made it clear that he had already decided to go to war. So help me understand this. Here's the Secretary of State. So he doesn't know about a decision to, be, to, to go to war. You're the 
assistant secretary level director of policy planning and the person who goes to the NSC meetings. You don't know. So describe this situation and what does it tell us about whatever American foreign policy decisions? Well, it ha has the virtue of being true. Uh, that was the case. The decision had effectively been made, if not formally made, as the Secretary of State came to recognize. Uh, his later involvement was much more with the President than when he had his famous dinner with the President in August, was to talk about the mech how we would go to war, the UN role, congressional role, and, and so forth. But, it's, but essentially, this, this consequential decision uh, had been made without a formal decision-making process. And every president chooses the nature of his interagency process, the National Security Council system, varying degrees of formality. Uh, this was one of the less formal uh, than I've been in. A, and I've worked for four, for four administrations. This, this leaned in the direction of uh, less formal. And the president later on, when he was challenged on that, said, uh, I didn't feel I needed a formal decision. I knew where everybody stood. Uh, the problem with that is uh, for conviction politicians, and George W. Bush is first and foremost a conviction politician, sometimes the, uh, the formality of a decision-making process can be good because it challenges assumptions and it challenges convictions. And I thought uh, the president was not ultimately served as well as he might have been by uh, the decision-making process that he was comfortable with and that had grown up uh, around him. I think... Uh, you know, as I predicted, this war would become the centerpiece of the administration's foreign policy. I believe the administration went into it not thinking that, but basically went into it thinking that the administration would likely accomplish fairly, uh, not fairly, would, 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 would accomplish historic ends. Iraq would be democratized. The rest of the region would not be able to res resist the example of a democratic, uh, effective Iraq. And it thought it could accomplish those ends at, at relatively modest costs. I challenged both. I thought it would be extraordinarily expensive, and I didn't think we would have ends that would be particularly uh, positive. And for those of you, you know, students here, again, it shows you the power of assumptions. It's uh, what you feed into your model in some ways is uh, predictive. And if you assume certain things, you've just, you, certain then conclusions follow. And you've got to be tenacious and rigorous and identifying and testing what it is you uh, assume, because so much of your analysis will be, will be biased, and I, and, I, and I believe that was the case here. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure what this has to do with Syria, but uh, okay. certainly I think that's on many people's minds sure. tonight. So let me segue just a little bit here. Okay. So President Obama has been making a case for the past week uh, for uh, limited, proportionate, militarily significant cruise missile attacks on uh, Syria. And tonight is his major speech at 9 p.m., but he's been previewing it today. Let's see what he said. This is from earlier today. When 98% of the world says these are the worst kinds of weapons, because they're indiscriminate. They don't differentiate between uh, somebody in uniform, uh, mother, or the child. And as a consequence, you have a treaty that was ratified by the United States, overwhelmingly in the United States Senate, by uh, countries representing 98% of the world's populations. There's a reason for that. And we have to make sure that that ban does not erode, because when that ban starts eroding, then other weapons of mass destruction uh, start looking more acceptable because the international community is not willing to stand up uh, on their behalf. If we are going to have any kind of serious uh, enforcement of this international ban on chemical weapons, then ultimately the United States has to be involved. And a credible threat may be what pushes the kind of political, uh, political settlement that I think we'd all prefer. Okay, so Richard, uh, last month you read a, a piece in the Financial Times, if I remember, in which you called for, uh, quote, fairly heavy use of cruise missiles essentially to degrade Assad's uh, chemical weapons uh, capabilities after the August attack. Not his chemical weapons capabilities, but to basically inflict a price on Assad so he would not use chemicals again, and so others who might possess weapons of mass destruction 
would themselves be, if you will, indirectly deterred because they would understand that any potential use, any use would, would bring with it great cost. So thinking about where we are now and what you argued and what President Obama has been arguing, if I take it you essentially agree with him or you disagree or what would you like to say? Uh, I think the United States uh, is correct to say that Syrian use of chemical weapons not only happened but needs to be responded to. To simply leave that out there would be a, a serious mistake. Uh, I think the president weakened his own case by not responding the first time chemicals were used. They've been used repeatedly, uh, as best we uh, know. So it's hard to say uh, a red line exists as he, as he articulated and then not back it up when the red line was uh, crossed. I also think the administration got into real trouble in uh, trying to reassure Congress that any use of force would be modest and not get us enmeshed in the Syrian uh, civil war uh, at the same, I think Secretary Kerry went so far in the last 40 hours to talk about an unbelievably limited use of force. At the same time, its message was to reinforce a norm and make clear to the Syrians and the rest of the world that any use of chemical weapons would, would, be, an ex, would be expensive. And the tension between dealing with the American political climate that had evolved <coughs> and trying to send the message. Essentially, the, at best it was a tension, at worst it was a contradiction. So I think the... Uh, that was the problem. I think the president further hurt himself by the decision to go to the Congress. If the norm existed and it was that important to act on it, he could and should have acted on it. Indeed, I, I found it slightly surreal when in his uh, statement he, he said uh, that Saturday afternoon that he possesses the authority to act, but nonetheless he wanted to go to Congress. Uh, if it was that important to reinforce the norm and the authority was possessed, it seemed to me this was, this was inconsistent with those uh, assessments. Uh, I also disagree with the arguments from critics that somehow uh, a use of force would inevitably get you into the Civil War. I don't think that's true. There's a clear demarcation here. I agree with the administration between a use of force to respond to chemical weapons use and direct involvement in the Civil War, which the United States is for the most part uh, precluded. There's other ways we could dramatically affect the Civil War. And indeed, one, it's an area where the President has articulated a policy but has not implemented for the most part, which is serious uh, arming of select elements of the, op of the, of the Syrian opposition. So uh, all of that is backdrop. So yes, all things being equal, um, I supported a uh, strike. And I was very worried over the last couple of days that we would potentially reach a point where the Congress wouldn't support it. And then I thought the United States would feel, the President had put himself into potentially a terrible box where either he went ahead and struck anyway, which could potentially trigger a legal, political, constitutional crisis, or he wouldn't act, which would, I think, have real national security consequences. Now, in the last 24 hours, plus or minus, this has been somewhat, as we used to say in government, OBE, overtaken by events. By the way, when you graduate from the, in order to graduate from the Kennedy School, you have to learn expressions such as this. And, uh, <coughs> You know, with this question of whether you, uh, this Russian-American effort to potentially get the Syrians to escape the physical consequences of their use to get out from under the threat of an attack if they were to agree to give up all of their uh, chemical weapons, presumably uh, to some international custodianship according to a certain timetable and so forth. Uh, coming back to where we began the conversation, that's potentially an interesting idea. To implement that idea would be, would be extraordinarily difficult. To get a, in order to do this, you would need an accurate and complete accounting of Syrian uh, chemical stocks. You would need some type of uh, international custody uh, immediately. You would need uh, all sorts of inspections. You would need destruction mechanisms. You'd need Syrian signature of the Chemical Weapons Convention. And all this would have to be done in the middle of a civil war. Well, you just call time out. Uh, a demanding, uh, but I think that said, I think the administration essentially has opened this up and now has to be uh, very careful it doesn't lose control of what happens uh, in the Security Council, in the Congress, and so forth. If I were advising the President, I would say, rather than delay, continue to press for the vote, get the vote in Congress, and indeed use the argument that the only way to get the Syrians to potentially give up all their chemical weapons on the terms that would be acceptable would be under the threat of a use of force by the United States. So rather than seeing this as undermining the move to get uh, congressional authorization, I would actually try to harness this
to that uh, effort and essentially tell the Syrians you've got a choice. Either you give up your chemical weapons promptly and under terms that give us confidence you've in fact done that, or you will face the alternative consequences, which presumably you uh, do not. Now whether the president can orchestrate that, given the domestic slippage uh, politically, and given the international environment, uh, I'm not, I have my doubts, but that's essentially where we are now. Okay, and I, and I would bet that's a pretty good forecast to, of one of the central arguments you'll hear the president make tonight at 9 o'clock. The question will be how persuasive that is to how many people. Well, I'm not so sure, because one of the, well, we'll find out soon enough, but one of the questions is whether they press ahead with the political action in Congress or whether this is used as a rationale for putting it on hold. And I actually think there's at least a good chance that the, the latter will be the case. Well, I would su suspect, if I were just betting, that the argument will be made in just the terms you okay. yep. made, but that recognizing that they're not going to win with that argument, their second best argument is, and uh, we're going to continue working on it with respect to the Congress, because yeah. if you ask about a member of Congress, sure. what is their first, second, and third objective? Not to be accountable. So if they can find an excuse for not voting, they're not voting. It's quite possible. And one of the interesting questions will be also at the risk of getting into the weeds will be whether a resolution can be crafted in the Congress rather than the one that was being worked on, which would support this effort to get the Syrians out of the chemical weapons business. Failing that, whether you could build in a trigger for military action or whether that would require a separate resolution. And I believe that will be one of the interesting side debates but over the next a, couple of days. There's another forum on the, uh, we're not going to show it right now because it'll take us off to an aside, but a forum in which you're discussing a test ban treaty with the Soviets. You won't even remember it. Absolutely. Gotcha. Uh, and you make a very good argument. You can go look it up on the forum website. Would I disagree with it now? You, yeah, well, you might. You <laughs> might. Uh, so the, you make an argument that uh, would, in the context of Syria, say there's no conceivable, implementable way to imagine Assad giving up his chemical weapons in a way that you would ever believe it. So this is a kind of a fantasy. Uh, you, would, you argued in the test ban version at the time, where it was, was a test ban that was proposing to do even t uh, a prohibition of low yield tests, and given the technologies that existed at the time. So if you try to think about this current idea, is it, does it pass your, if I go back to the bureaucratic guide here, is there a feasible, implementable form of this, or is this just an illusion? Yeah. Uh, I think there's a, a feasible, implementable approach in the sense that you could start down a path that would have some credibility, but you'd have to be prepared for something of long duration, a degree, a considerable degree of uncertainty. But what I would do, I, I also think that we're kind of stuck with it. Yeah. And so then I would say, and it's the parallel that comes to mind is um, just over 20 years ago when Saddam Hussein, after he had uh, invaded and occupied and uh, quote unquote annexed Kuwait, and before the uh, United States and the international coalition, we had uh, amassed in um, 19, then by January 15th, 1991, before we were to go to war, we thought that Saddam Hussein would put out, if you will, the equivalent of what's happened in the last 24 hours. Here, exactly. Kind of ideas to derail things. And we had prepared uh, at the National Security Council and at the agency and had gotten approved a statement we were then going to say, if Saddam Hussein had put out any half loaf, I'm going to start withdrawing from Kuwait, we're going to say, fine, here's the, here's the yardsticks you have to meet. 24 hours, you've got to have accomplished this with standing down these military forces, locating these here, working with these authorities there. And literally, we had a very detailed timeline. And I would simply say that we have to put together an extraordinarily demanding timeline for the uh, Syrians. And so if it turns out they are un unwilling, to, not one they can't meet, but one they, if they were committed to meeting, they could meet, but it would be demanding. And if they then chose not to meet, it would be the predicate for military action. Okay. One last question, and then we're going to go to the audience. So uh, over the, I mean, everybody is opining on the Syria issue. Over the weekend in the Wall Street Journal, Peggy Noonan had a piece that I found uh, very, uh, very powerful. Let's look, she has about 10 good points in it, but this is the one I want Richard to address. She says, basically, wake up, 
Washington and the foreign policy establishment are no longer connected to the broad American public. That she says this is not an argument between libertarians and neoconservatives or left and right or Republicans and Democrats. That's the way we've traditionally thought about this. She thinks it's a fight between the country, America, and Washington, where the broad American public has basically tuned out of the wise words from the, the great and the good. Uh, and then she's got a next paragraph about the wise men, which is even tougher. So, but I'm just giving you yeah. the easy part. I think so she's onto something. Look, if I were to write the book Foreign Policy Begins at Home, I would probably add a third part to it. I, I write that the two biggest threats to America's national security were one, this overreach and what we were trying to accomplish in the world, and two, underperformance at home. I'd actually add a third one now, which would be global underreach, which is a wonky phrase for uh, isolationism. I actually believe across party lines now, there is a, uh, an emerging isolationism. And it is uh, born of uh, fatigue with international involvement, particularly the, in the interventions in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. It is in part born of uh, lingering domestic problems. The fact, for example, that unemployment level, that not just that unemployment levels have stayed high in percentage terms, but long-term unemployment has uh, persisted or grown. And em employment levels haven't reached the point uh, where they were five, five years ago before the uh, financial uh, crisis. I think there's disaffection and alienation from political leadership uh, more broadly. So I, th I, think the, I think Peggy is right, that I actually think at the moment, going forward, just as big of a threat to American uh, national security that we try to do too much in the world is that we, we, we try to do too little. And this is what markets tell you. I and mean, to use a, you know, I live in New York now, so I'm, I'm always drawn to market metaphors. But you have bubbles and you have busts. And mar pendulum, what's the plural, pendula? Pendula overswing. So the tendency is you go too far in one direction, and then the correction comes in, and the correction overswings the other way. So I would actually argue that after 9-11, the United States became overly interventionist in what it tried to accomplish in the world. And now the counter reaction to that is going too far in the other direction. And we're seeing it in elements of the Republican Party and elements of the Democratic uh, party, and that worries me in its own way just as much as what we've uh, been doing over the last decade. Okay, we're going to go now to the audience, but I'm going to call first on a professor here, Megan O'Sullivan, who works closely with uh, Richard. He worked with him before, but they are now co-venture or co co collaborating on a Northern Ireland peace venture. So Megan, you can ask about anything you want, but then the floor is open, the rules are here, Line up at the microphones. There are two, two microphones on the floor and two in the loges. And introduce yourself, though I've introduced Megan. Great. And questions are short, and they have a question mark. This, so. is, this, is, this is a ringer. <laughs> no, she's going to ask, you a, really, she's gonna ask well. you a really hard question, uh, given that I was so easy. Yeah. Okay. No, um, actually, Richard, it's, it's great to see you here. Welcome. And I wanted to give you a chance to talk about a little different part of the world, talk about Asia and the Pacific. In the past, I've heard you say, I think wisely, that our foreign policy towards Asia is actually, uh, it's a little less ambitious than our foreign policy towards the Middle East, in large part because we're not trying to remake societies as we are in the Middle East. We're dealing with issues that are bilateral or multilateral national security issues. So I want to ask you about China and the $64,000 question about what is China's domestic trajectory? How much does that actually affect the United States? And do we have any ability to influence that trajectory? And if so, should we exercise it? Thanks, Megan. Uh, Briefly. <laughs> Good. Two things about, uh, I'll say two things. One about Asia. And please line up at the, at the microphones. They're open. If a part of my message is the United States ought to somewhat draw back or diminish or dial down its involvement in the Middle East, I think we ought to dial it up in Asia. And the reasons, as Megan suggested, is this, is this is where the great powers of the 21st century are located. It's where the bulk of the world's economy is located. Uh, and what we're beginning to see is the return of history to Asia. We're beginning to see the resumption of great power politics, the rise of nationalism, all this against the backdrop of the absence of political reconciliation. All of this against the backdrop of a lack of political military institutions and, and diplomatic bandwidth. Uh, 
And here are the kinds of instruments the United States can bring to bear, naval power, air power, trade negotiations, uh, diplomacy across the board, can actually be effective because our goal is to affect the external behavior of these mature countries rather than their internal nature and composition, which is often what we're trying to do in the Middle East. So I actually think the, that Asia is objectively more important in the sense it's where the great powers interact. And it turns out the tools we have to bring to bear are actually more likely to be effective because there's a better relationship between our goals and the instruments of foreign policy. In terms of China, so much of the debate I expect here and elsewhere is about the Chinese threat, about China's rise and all that. Uh, I, I take a lot of that with a grain of salt. I can't think of an inbox more difficult right now than the inbox facing the new Chinese leadership. You've got a dramatically slower growth, and I don't believe the official numbers. I think it's well below 7%. You've got to move from an export-led economic model to a domestic uh, demand-led economic model. Again, easier articulated than uh, implemented, to say the least. You've got terrible pollution problems, real environmental degradation. You have demographic problems from aging to the consequences of the uh, one-child policy. You have corruption that's not a problem, but is essentially intrinsic to the system. Indeed, at times, corruption is the system. Uh, you've got a political system that in no way has kept up with the energy of the, uh, of the economy. I could go on and on, but I actually think China's domestic struggles are enormous. Now, the one area that, that gives me pause then for foreign policy is whether at times there's a temptation to turn to foreign policy and nationalism as a way of providing uh, legitimacy and a lubricant for society, absent the lubricant to double-digit economic growth. So I think the exaggerations of China's might are real, but I do think there are, uh, there's real uncertainties about how China evolves. I don't think the United States can have significant uh, direct impact in, in, in remaking China to our, to our image, but I do think by our relations with uh, China's neighbors, by our relations with China, by our dialogue, by our physical presence, by efforts to integrate them on reasonable terms into regional and global institutions, we can affect Chinese calculations. And that ought to be the, uh, the goal of American foreign policy. Okay, let's start with this lady, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, my question is actually for you, Professor Allison. In a recent- and Introduce yourself, please, oh. yeah. Right. My name is Michaela, and I'm a sophomore at the college. In a recent article in The Atlantic, you referred to possible actions we could take in Syria as what would the godfather do? So essentially a horse head in the bed, an offer they couldn't refuse. Is there a concern that if the president were to implement such strategies that we would set some sort of precedent for dirty politics, for if you cross the, if you cross the red line, there will actually be no holds barred? It's an extremely good question. So uh, I had a lead piece in the Atlantic on Monday under the provocative question or title WWGD, which is a, a sort of an analog to the bumper sticker that some evangelicals have called WWJD, what would Jesus do? So this was what would Godfather do if the objective were to dissuade Assad from future actions. And I think, and I do this in my class, that in trying to think about thugs in the world, and Assad is a good candidate, thinking about what impacts thugs is a whole lot better than thinking very abstractly about what impacts countries. So if you ask about the Godfather, as I mentioned in that story, uh, in the article, when he wanted a movie mogul in Hollywood to give a part to his godson, the, which he had rejected, the movie mogul woke up the next morning with his favorite horse's head lying beside him in the bed. And this made a big impression on him. So as compared to... The guy got the, guy got the part. He got the part, yes. That was Frank Sinatra, if you believe it, in another version of the story. But in any case, so the idea that one's impacting the calculations of individuals, that they're things that they care about, and that he may care about his horse more than he cares about a lot of other things. Now, when you start dealing in those back alleys, which is what it is, you've always got to ask yourself, yeah, but who are we? And what are our values that constrain us from doing some things, but nonetheless, that's not a reason for 
not saying, what's moving this guy? Because it's this guy that we're trying to move. So I would say there are quite a lot of things, I believe, and I suggested a number of them there, which we, we should be thinking about, because I think the temptation, especially for policy wonks and like Richard and me, is to discuss this in terms of, actually, uh, Secretary Kerry had a statement that got close to this, that we can attack Syria in a way that puts at risk no American lives because we're just going to launch cruise missiles against targets, not people, targets. So you get to sort of anesthetize the fact that the proposal is to kill people. The proposal is to send some Americans to go and kill people and to risk their own lives, even if they're only pilots flying in the zone, which is not the end of the story. So I would say the actual translating it into godfather terms reminds us that there's blood. Yeah. And that if one's proposing to attack uh, Assad with, with uh, cruise missiles, you're proposing to kill some people, and you're proposing to tell some other people who are our, I mean, many of our classmates, uh, you go and kill this guy. Oh, my God. No, we don't do that. We just say there were casualties or... You know, that, uh, so that's, uh, that was the basis of the argument. I don't know if Richard agrees or disagrees, but let's take this in a uh, Chris, I uh, work in technology. Uh, could you comment on the current U.S. national surveillance issue as it relates to foreign policy and domestic policy? Sure. Uh, let me as say the like, president of the Council on Foreign Relations, he's supposed to know about all this, so good. No, look, I, look, let me say one thing for students here. I actually think this whole area of cyber issues in some ways will be in for the next couple of decades the equivalent of the nuclear issue when we started out and it's a great place for fertile thinking it's a, a it's an unregulated domain for the most part of international relations there's very few rules and even fewer arrangements so if there's an area where we really need a, a new generation it's people who understand international relations and understand uh, digital and cyber issues it's I think uh, tremendously important and so it ought to be a creative moment in the field, again, akin to arms control in the 50s when we brought together international relations people, mathematicians, and scientists. I actually think we need something now to think about it. There's a domestic side and there's a, um, an international side. On the international side, I, I think the biggest question is how do we, what kind of rules are we going to try to set up? What, what's it going to look like? Right now, it's largely unregulated. What is it we want to encourage? What is it we want to discourage? What kind of capabilities? What kind of behaviors? To me, it's a wide open uh, area, and we have to think about what sort of things do we want to do, and is there a risk that if we start doing certain kinds of things, might others then feel liberated to do those things uh, to us? We're, for example, incredibly vulnerable. I'll take one sector, the financial sector. So we have to think very hard about what kind of a, if you will, cyber regime we want to try to, uh, in some ways, encourage, quote unquote, out there domestically, there's all sorts of issues, it seems to me, about privacy versus security. There are some trade-offs there. Uh, and and you know, I think we have to be prepared to have a, a grown-up conversation about it. And there are questions about what should be, uh, are there situations where we ought to accept certain limits on individual privacy in order uh, to have collective security? If so, what are they? What kind of processes do we set up in order to monitor the, not just the decisions, but the implementations of those uh, decisions, what sort of things are, can, can be safely and intelligently and productively discussed in public as opposed to, to private. And I think, that, you know, I think that's kind of where we are now, is figuring out what are the rules internationally, what are the policies uh, we're comfortable with, and then domestically, what are the trade-offs. So I think it's early days on, on both of the uh, on, on both of these uh, debates. You know, I, I have certain views myself, but um, just in terms of framing, that's where I think we, we, we are. And I, I would just second Richard's proposition about as an opportunity for students. It's a domain where um, this is going to be a live, a active debate for the next 10, 20, 30 years, and a place where people that have some sense for the technology as well as some sense for the policy have an opportunity. Oh, yeah. There's a terrific, a couple of terrific things here at the Kennedy School and Harvard on this. Vinky, who is a former dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, has a cyber group in the Belfer Center that looks at these topics. 
There's a policy uh, group that Joe Nye and some folks at MIT do, which is the second group. And then thirdly, Jack Goldsmith, who's at the law school, a professor, has been writing on this very thoughtfully and is teaching the course. So just for advertising. This lady in the, in the loge, please. Thank you very much for speaking here today. My name is Neha Dalal, and I'm asking this question on behalf of the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum Committee. So public opinion, both domestic and international US foreign intervention has declined recently. You mentioned the pendulum behavior earlier. Do you believe that it's merely following the short-term trends, or are there also long-term trends at play? There was that famous strategist who, like me, didn't go to the Kennedy School, said, named Yogi Berra. Uh, once said, uh, predictions are always hard, particularly about the future. And uh, so it's a little bit hard to know how long term uh, this will be. But, but my hunch is it's pretty wide and deep. And for reasons I alluded to, I do think there'll be a long term consequence of the Iraq and Afghan situations. I believe that our domestic difficulties are likely to persist in some ways, particularly for significant numbers of Americans. And even if the analysis, in my view, is incorrect, I believe that foreign policy will, to some extent, or foreign involvement, will, will, will bear some of the quote-unquote blame. I don't think our schools teach these issues well. Our media doesn't cover it as systematically as it uh, used to. So short of something happening that galvanizes the American body politic, uh, it could be very hard. Now, the last thing that came around that galvanized us was obviously awful, and we're, sell we're marking the uh, anniversary of it tomorrow, which is 9-11. And, you know, and I'm hoping it doesn't take really bad things that uh, it's almost like thundering out there in order to gain the attention. But that history would suggest that's the case. The only other way it happens is if a president comes into office and invest tremendous political capital and says, this is going to be one of my priorities and I'm going to repeatedly speak and appeal to the American public to build a consensus for, for greater sorts of uh, global involvement absent uh, a massive crisis or, or challenge or threat. That's tough to do. And there's cost and opportunity cost there. So my own hunch is uh, it's going to be difficult for some, time to, for some time to come absent a significant crisis. The lady in the lodge, please. I say one other thing. I say one other thing. Please. I think also what I don't know is what will be the lasting implications of President Obama's decision to go to Congress for authorization for the uh, Syria action, and whether that is a serious constraint, not just on him for his remaining three years, but on his successors, and whether this also has a certain, uh, again, constraining or limiting role on our ability to, uh, to use force. But, but clearly the president has moved, the, to use the pendulum image again, uh, away from the, uh, the side of the, the spectrum which favors executive uh, latitude and discretion when it comes to the use of force. And I believe that is now one of the legacies of his presidency. And Richard, let me stay with that just for a second because I was doing that in class today. So, uh, I mean, you have to remember, President Obama is a graduate of Harvard Law School. President Obama was teaching constitutional law at the University of Chicago in another phase of his life. So on Saturday, in one of the explanations he gave of his decision the previous Saturday to call time out on this, he said, I, he was giving the account of why did he go to Congress. He said, I do not believe that the Syrian use of chemical weapons or potential future uses poses an imminent or direct threat to American national interests. And therefore, if I understand the Constitution, it had something about Congress declares war, even though it's not been necessarily interpreted that way. And there's this War Powers Act, even though it hadn't been exactly interpreted that way. But in the case in which one's making war, uh, if I would choose a phrase, a war of choice, somebody called it in a good book, why should one president and his executive authority make this as opposed to how about the people's representatives? What about that? Several reasons. Uh, one is we're not talking about going to war. This is by definition a constrained, limited military action. If you will, it would be an intervention of choice. 
I wouldn't call it quite a war of choice. Second of but all, if you if you were in Damascus and 250 explosions occurred, sure. would you think that's an act of war? On, on It'd be a hostile act. If they happened in Boston, I think we would think we had been attacked. Yeah, yeah it'd be attacked. I mean, then the, I'm, I'm suggesting that, and when the, you go back to the definition of what's a declaration of war, does it mean a declaration of any time military force as an instrument of policy is used, is there, or is there a certain threshold? And if you look at the history of American national security, of presidential decision making, there's a, a much higher threshold uh, than that. So uh, I would say that to begin with. Second of all, under the War Powers Act, he does enjoy considerable latitude. That's yeah. indeed, it's interesting, when you go back to the framing of the War Powers Act, uh, a lot of it was meant to constrain executive authority in war making, and actually in some ways empowered executives, because it gave them a 90 day period to essentially use, short, use force absent congressional uh, declarations. Also, if Congress wanted to prevent the United States from using cruise missiles against Syria, it can do so. It tomorrow could pass legislation saying no funds can be used, uh, no in this or any other right. act, to, fu to allow cruise missile strikes uh, against it. So Congress doesn't need to, to have this, uh, to, to have this uh, authorization. It was also introduced at the 11th hour. It would have been something else if from the beginning of the crisis, sure. the president had put this out there and said, I want, you know, this is gonna be part of my decision making. But no, it didn't happen that way, Graham. It happened at the 11th hour in the aftermath of Mr. Cameron's uh, defeat. Right in Parliament, so it looked, uh, it looked improvised, it looked uh, ad hoc. Why so did it, it look improvised? I, mean, I think the people on his national security team were the most surprised of all. So it's, it's very hard for me to, to, to make the, either the political or, 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 or legal case that somehow it's, it's extra, in any way it's extra legal. It seems to me it's firmly in the political tradition of, of the contemporary presidency. Indeed, it doesn't expand presidential powers. It's quite consistent with the, the normal exercise of them. Right, and I certainly would agree with that. I was just trying to remind us that this is a person who did teach constitutional law and who has views about the topic, which may or may not be right, but what was reflected in that were, I think, long-standing views. And I bet you, I have no idea what he taught at the University of Chicago in his class on constitutional law, but certainly as a senator, when he offered his views about yeah. when and how people, the, the U.S. government should attack people, not just making war, but attacking people, he thought that, uh, he argued, that if there were not an imminent threat, it should be on a basis of a collegial decision, not just yeah. the president of the United States. Let me say one thing. Also, it does, it's clearly a direct threat. I think the, the, yeah. the weapons of mass destruction. Also, also you know, the president said when he made the statement publicly originally that he had the authorization. He didn't need congressional yes. authority. Now, previous presidents have been very clear about this. When, for example, President uh, Bush 41, during the, uh, the Gulf War, he specifically went to Congress, did not ask for authorization. If you read every White House document, he asked for, he asked for congressional support. He basically said, I have all the authority I need. Whether you vote for this or not is your business, but thank you very much, I am gonna go and enforce uh, Article 51 of the UN Charter, as well as various UN uh, resolutions. The president could have gone to Congress as a political matter, which I see would have been fine, I, to consult fully with Congress and maybe to get an expression of support. Something very different than saying, I can only act if I get an, an explicit grant of authority. And that seemed to me to be a bridge too far that was both unnecessary and unwise. Hey, that's very interesting. Excuse me, we had an excursion, but we're to you. Hi, my name is Lindsay, and I'm a freshman at the college. And my name I am. How my, is it so far? What? It's pretty great. That's good. Two weeks, not bad. <laughs> right. And my question is how solid are the facts to make a decision on action in Syria, and what will the consequences be if we make the wrong decision without world support? Well, the facts, some facts are pretty well known that chemical weapons were used. What we don't know is the exact, the exact chain of authority and decision making on the Syrian side. So I think there, there's some uncertainty. There's different ideas about why what happened happened, but what we do know is that chemical weapons have been used repeatedly, and it's uh, based upon everything I know about uh, Syria. It's hard to imagine there's uh, this was done in a freelancing way. Uh, so I think you have to assume there's been uh, government support for or tolerance of chemical uh, weapons use. But I, but I think you're onto something larger. So let me sort of run with your question a little bit. 
which is, and it's, it gives me a chance to make a slightly larger point, which uh, there's going to be lots of unknowns. I sound like Donald Rumsfeld here, but let me do it for a second. There's going to be all sorts of unknowns here. There's unknowns about specifically the decision making on the Syrian side, who exactly uh, said what and when. There are questions about if we are to use force, what will be the result? What will be the direct result? How, what will be destroyed? We don't know how the Syrians will react to that in terms of how much will it degrade, for example, their ability to pursue the civil war. We don't know how they or how their backers will respond. What would Iran do? What would Hezbollah do? What might the Russians uh, do? And the reason I say all this is any time you set in motion events, uh, it, I mean, Clausewitz is the one who wrote about this most eloquently, you, uh, or as did Shakespeare, uh, things, un things unfold. And so there's two things. One is you have to make these decisions in foreign policy with imperfect knowledge about what exists. And then on top of that, you do it with, by definition, imperfect knowledge of the future. Because there's too many actors who are too, making independent uh, decisions. So, you know, intelligence, you asked what are the facts. Well, intelligence is not often, it's really about judgments. We say, here's all the information. As best we can tell, we're, say, 90% certain. We have not high confidence that this is what happened. And then we, with varying degrees of confidence, we believe this would be the likely direct military results of an action. This might be how various parties uh, respond. But you're then very quickly moving from sciences into arts. And it's one of the reasons that, that foreign policy, I would argue, uh, is so difficult. That you've got to make extraordinarily consequential uh, decisions based upon imperfect or at times incorrect information. Look at what happened in 2003. People, you know, Colin Powell and others went out there, including me, saying this is what we quote unquote know. We thought they were facts about Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. We were flat out wrong. So even when you think you know things, you may be wrong. And you, there's many areas you know you don't know 100% of the, and, and you're basically saying, this is our, our best estimate. And that's, uh, but, but at the end of the day, you can't be immobilized by that. Because not acting is as consequential a policy as acting. So you have to be just as rigorous about assessing the, the default option of not doing anything. Because that also is going to set in motion all sorts of trends. Like if we don't act on Syria, you have to ask yourself, how might it affect calibrations in Iran about their nuclear program? What about North Korea? What about Russia? How might it affect the Syrian opposition? So forth and so on. So you've, you've, you've got to be, you know, the only thing I constantly remind people is be just as rigorous about every option and not just the option you have doubts about. Good. Please, sir. Hello, my name is Christian Pico. I work at an educational startup company here in Boston. Um, well, so I was glad you brought up the uh, weapons of mass destruction, which was popularly exposed as the you know, knowing fabrication. No, I beg your pardon. It was exposed as we were wrong. There was zero evidence in my experience that there was any fabrication. People, there was no misleading of the American public. It simply turned out that we were wrong, plain and simple. I wanted to bring up another example from another administration where you worked, the first Bush administration, where the example of the, I think it was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ruler, uh, manufactured atrocity stories about uh, infants being tossed onto the ground, which was later found out to be totally fabricated, which was used to uh, kind of indoctrinate the U.S. population to get them to support war. So just given this sequence of basically fabrications or exaggerations, deliberate exaggerations, along the lines of, as you say, the, the decision was already made to go to war. They just concoct whatever they need, whether it's true or false. Uh, why wouldn't we think the same thing about these supposed chemicals, especially when the Russian government has come out and said that they have proof that it's the rebels, actually, who caused these chemical attacks and that the U.S. has been covertly arming these rebel groups illegally um, all along also? And um, if you can uh, aver that these are actually the facts and we shouldn't uh, be wary of these, um, aren't you concerned that uh, by opposing Russia and China, who are both nuclear powers in this very volatile region, that, you know, say, like, they're giving Syrian um, air uh, defenses abilities to shoot down, say, U.S. fighters, and, like, if a Russian-backed, um, you know, air defense system shot down a U.S. fighter, doesn't have the danger to widen the conflict into a worldwide nuclear war? 
Okay, let me take two parts of that. Uh, in terms of the, I uh, already said what I had to say about the weapons of mass destruction in the, se in the second Iraq war. In the first one, yeah, there were certain pieces of information which were later turned out to be not true. Uh, people at the time didn't know that. More important, it doesn't change the basic case. You're not going to stand up in here and say Saddam Hussein did not invade, occupy, and annex Kuwait. You're not going to say he violated the basic tenets of the, uh, or maybe you would, I'll just say, I don't believe one can say he did not violate the basic tenets of the uh, UN Charter. In my own view, it posed a major strategic threat to American interests. So even if you can cherry pick this or that uh, statement that was incorrect, the larger narrative is 100% right in the United States, I believe, in the international community. Uh, was right to, to do what it did. And the world, uh, I believe, was a better place uh, for that. In terms of the, the current uh, situation... That contradicts your earlier statement. The, on the, in, the, in the case of the... Uh, you know, if the Russians supply uh, air defense systems, which you know, they have provided lots of weapon systems to the Syrians, we're not going to... As best I understand, we're not flying American pilots and plane manned aircraft over Syria in part to uh, avoid the possibility of uh, American casualties. But if there are situations where we have to uh, destroy equipment provided by Russia or Iran, we'll have to take that into account. Is there a chance for some war widening? Yes, conceivably. Do I think it would lead to a serious escalation? No. But coming back to the previous question, that's something you're going to have to factor in. You're going to have to say, what are the risks of this kind of action? What is the uh, potential risk of, of inaction? You're going to have to choose your, you choose your policy. This lady, please. Hi. Thank you for being patient. Yes. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Valentina Perez, and I'm a junior at the college. Can you expand on your previous statement um, about how important it is for presidents to seek public and or congressional approval, even authorization on national security issues, even if that approval or authorization would be more symbolic and wouldn't be necessary for the president to act? Uh, as a matter of practice, I don't think it's all that important. And by that I mean, in my experience, things that go well, the public tends to support, regardless of what was done at the front end. And things that go badly, the, pro the public tends to uh, dislike, regardless of what, the, uh, what happened politically at the front end. So the idea that you get political cover, uh, in my experience, simply isn't true. Now, that said, particularly as the scale of an activity is likely to go up, I do think you buy it. I think there's two reasons to get a degree of public uh, support. One is utilitarian. I think it's still, it may buy you a little bit more support than you otherwise uh, would have. The other is there is something normative about it. There is something to be said, to say the least, in a democracy that large undertakings ought not to be taken uh, privately. That the, the larger an undertaking, the, whether it's a domestic policy undertaking, the Affordable Care Act, uh, immigration reform, what have you, or uh, a budget deal, or a, ma a major foreign policy undertaking. There's a there's a case that you want to have public buy-in. Uh, that's 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 you know the way we are. Uh, but I would say that that goes up with the scale of the uh, the under so, so if what was being contemplated here was a massive war with like Iraq and Afghanistan with hundred thousand plus American troops and all that. The, po the possibility of significant casualties, uh, economic costs, and the rest. Okay, then, then I think the argument for congressional, formal congressional involvement goes up significantly. But I think modest undertakings, then I would say the case for executive discretion goes up. Up in the loge, please. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here today. My name is Sean Weller. I'm a student at the college. Um, you focused a lot on military assistance, and I wanted to ask a question about economic assistance. In um, countries such as Pakistan, we provide heavy economic assistance for the sake of building schools, improving health care, but many Pakistani officials have actually said that perhaps free trade would be a better thing to give them um, and that they might appreciate that more. What do you believe is a better option and what's kind of the moral, pragmatic, or security yeah. foundation of that? Uh, on economic aid, I'm a great believer in humanitarian aid for crises, uh, disease, so forth. But I don't believe in economic aid, with one exception, as a development tool. And the one exception is that it's conditioned aid, the kind of thing we're doing under the Millennium Challenge Corporation, where you essentially provide economic aid in order to encourage and reward certain types of political and economic reforms. And there's a pretty good record uh, there. 
On Pakistan, I think you're dead on. Exactly right. Uh, textile quotas for Pakistan would be a far more efficient way of helping Pakistanis than any amount of American aid. And Gary Samuels or Gary worked on this uh, for years. I would love to do it. The problem is the Congress has essentially uh, said, no way. More generally, I think trade is one of the great tools of American statecraft. And as a development tool, it's far more efficient than any amount of, uh, of aid. It also can give people a, a stake in, in certain types of uh, external behaviors, give them a stake in maintaining stability. I think there's powerful arguments for trade. Part of the problem is that American domestic support for trade has withered. Uh, Graham before highlighted the piece from Peggy Noonan. I think a very interesting challenge for Barack Obama could be that if Mike Froman, the US trade representative, who's an extraordinarily talented uh, young man, not to, whatever, official, if Mike is successful at negotiating one or both of the two major trade deals, the Trans-Pacific and the Trans-European, Trans-Atlantic trade deal, I think there's, there's open questions about how those will play in the Congress, which I think would be an ec I think it would be a great economic and political achievement if that got through, and just the opposite if it didn't. But with your point on Pakistan, the other thing is investment. I think you know, the great tools for development are much more, again, trade and investment. And the investment thing, though, is much to the countries itself more. They have got, you know, countries have to compete for investment, and they have to create frameworks legally, they have to create st conditions of stability, talented workforces, and so forth. So you want to have a race to the top for direct foreign investment. And again, I'm, I'm a great believer in trade and investment, uh, much more than, than aid, with the one exception of conditional aid like we use for the Millennium Account. So with apologies, unfortunately, we have time for just one more question and this gentleman in the loge. At the end, when we stop, uh, if you come forward quickly, you can ask your question to Richard because we'll hang around for a minute. But this gentleman gets the last. Uh, thank moments. you, and thank you for being here. My name's Nick, and I'm from the UK. Um, I noticed in your background, you have some background in the Northern Ireland peace process, um, something which is closer to my side of the Atlantic. Um, and the Good Friday Agreement was signed, I think, 15 years ago, um, around about. And, exactly, um, 15 years ago. Oh, good. Um, and earlier, earlier in the summer, we had the riots in Northern Ireland, and it's, it's constantly in the news, um, problems. So I'd just love to have any thoughts you have uh, about the process. <laughs> And say well, have, something about this process that I you will. and Megan are part of. Yes, please. I have a lot of thoughts about it. Uh, what happened uh, over the last few months is there have been some protests, and some of them got violent in, in Northern Ireland over various issues. And the uh, political leadership of Northern Ireland last spring, the five parties that comprised the uh, executive of the Northern Ireland uh, Authority, the government there, got together. And they uh, called for the creation of a paddle, panel basically, uh, of the, the five political parties that have representation in the, the, the Northern Ireland executive. And they called for it to be chaired by uh, an outsider who was independent. And they uh, approached uh, me if I would be willing to take that on. And I agreed. And Megan uh, was good enough, Megan O'Sullivan, to agree to become the, uh, the vice chair of this uh, process. So she and I and a small team will be involved with the uh, political leadership, but more important, with, the, with the, really the, the population of Northern Ireland, with the people, uh, civil society, other groups uh, there to try to deal with uh, issues of uh, political, what are called parades, uh, protests, statements, uh, deal with uh, questions of flags and other emblems, deal with the question of the, the legacy of the past. Northern Ireland is also still a, a highly segregated society to deal with some of those uh, challenges about a, a future that brings people together. So it's a fairly uh, uh, daunting agenda, and it's something we'll be going over next week to, uh, to begin the process of uh, seeing if we can't make some headway between now. And the goal is quite ambitious, to come up uh, with something supported by the political leadership uh, before the end of the year. OK, let me uh, say on behalf of all of us here in the forum, I mean, this is, I think, a, a labor of love. You can see Richard's agenda crosses a pretty wide spectrum. Uh, we haven't concluded or, uh, or haven't come to good conclusions about all of these issues, but for those of you interested in Syria, tonight at 9 o'clock, the President's going to be speaking, and then again tomorrow night at 6 p.m. here in the forum, there's a forum session on Syria where uh, Nick Burns, Neil Ferguson from the History Department, Joe Nye, and Marissa Porges, who's a fellow at BCSIA,
will be struggling with the question, would you vote yes or no? Okay. So that can, will continue here tomorrow afternoon. And then there'll undoubtedly be a lot of additional conversation about Syria. But for tonight, foreign policy begins at home, a good book and a good read. If you want some lessons for bureaucracy, I think the bureaucratic entrepreneur, another good read. And you can see why we miss having Richard here all the time. But let's thank him for a great session. <laughs>